how do I how do I advise a client who, like I said, they may be calling you after hours, they may be calling you at a time that it would be impossible for you to approach the court and asking for assistance. And really we just we just tell people generally, we give them this information as early as we can when we know we might be dealing with domestic violence allegations so that they have an understanding of the Family Safety Center, how it works, uh, and they're not ex they're not anticipating that just because they've had a consult with us that they would be able to immediately hire us and at, at 6 p.m. or middle of the night and we would be able to jump in and do this. We explain that's not going to be a possibility. And here's what you need to know about, you know, obtaining your own pro se ex parte order, but that we will step in as soon as, you know, we are aware or made aware to kind of assist with that process. Um, so this kind of walks through at the very beginning, what is the person experiencing when they walk through the door at the Family Safety Center? They, they can get there, um, well, if they've already gone to the Family Safety Center, when they first walk through the door, they are put with a victim, victim's advocate. They explain what has happened to that person and the victim's advocate also usually explains to them what I explained previously was that there's two different options here. There is getting an order of protection and there is a criminal prosecution. There are uh, special detectives there that they can talk to if criminal prosecution is something they want to proceed with, which uh, I, you know, I think they advise them in the same way that I've explained it, maybe not as in much detail as I have, but I think so. Once they are done with that process and have an ex parte order, they would have to call the sheriff to determine if that's been served. Obviously that's not getting served by a private process server and I put the number in the materials because it is a special division that does civil service, not uh, you know criminal service. You have to give them the alleged victim's name, I mean, I'm sorry, the alleged aggressor's name because that's who they're serving and figure out, you know, has he been served? Um, if they live out of county, you're calling the sheriff's department in the county where they reside. So if they were in Fayette County or Tipton County, that's who's serving them or should be serving them. The judicial commissioners at 201, if they're approving an original petition being filed, it's not filed with the general, with the criminal general sessions court clerk. It's filed with the clerk in the hearing room. So when they direct you to the clerk, that's the clerk that sits in the courtroom upstairs, the hearing room that you need to be filing a petition with if you were filing a petition for the first time at 201. Their standard is five copies of everything. Uh, I don't e I don't even know exactly why. I just know that is that is how it needs to be done and you do look like an outsider if you don't take that many copies and then also your temporary order so if you're taking a client they're they're presenting with you they only need an order of protection this is not a divorce or a custody case or some other type of family law matter and you're filing it 201 that would be the process you're taking their petition five copies of everything and a copy of the ex parte order and you're taking it to the hearing room um, if there's minor children in your case, you always want to take two versions of the ex parte order and that's because the court may not be willing to grant it as to the minor children. So you always want to take a backup order that doesn't have the minor children listed, although if you're representing the victim, you're always probably going to list them initially. You sign the jacket. So you ask the same clerk for the jacket you sign to show that you're the attorney representing the uh, the victim or you know the alleged aggressor or the responding party the docket number when because of course you're filing without a docket number I really think when you're looking at the D part here on page one though I'm I'm saying this more from the the perspective if you're defending you're showing up for the first day you know you don't know where you're doing you're getting the jacket which already exists because they created it when that original petition was filed you're finding the docket number from that because a lot of times what your clients getting served with doesn't have a docket number it might have been rolled upon at the Family Safety Center through a video conference and then there's you know like a stamping system that they use, electronic stamping system, but it may not have been assigned a docket number yet, even though the court date is on there. So when you go in and you find the jacket and sign it, that'll give you the docket number. The last four digits are the most important. Um, 
you mainly need those when they're calling the docket or when you're looking at that. Um, do y'all, does everybody here know what uh, dot matrix printers are? Probably not. Okay, so they'll have a docket sitting on the table that's been printed. A dot matrix printer is the old printers that all the sheets were connected and it had that little perforation. Okay, so their, their docket is printed out on that. You'll see something like that. Um, and you'll be looking to figure out where am I on the docket. You know, even if you're the petitioner, you might not know where you're on the docket, but it just kind of gives you an idea so you can let your client know and so you can kind of watch because a lot of times during these hearings, they are going to, you're not going to just be sitting in there like you normally would in a civil hearing. They're going to clear the courtroom. They're going to try to maintain control over how many people are in there. Um, and so you just need to be aware of that and, and try to let your client know these, these things so you can... I just say kind of control their anxiety about the whole situation. You know, we're number 17 on the docket. There are several cases in front of us. The other thing you can do, the the victim's advocate is usually there because they are coordinating with whoever has shown up and doesn't have counsel, is that you can let the victim's advocate know, I'm here, I'm a private attorney, and I represent so-and-so. I mean, usually if you're a victim, not if you're aggressor, she doesn't care about you then. Um, she or he, but it's usually she and you'll just let her know that person does have a private attorney, it helps her also take something off her worry list because now she knows all these people I'm coordinating, this person has a private attorney, and if she has any information that she needs to let you know about, you can get that from her then. Uh, it might also help you when they're trying to tell people to get in and out because if you're sitting with her, they usually don't bother you. <laughs> if they're moving people around and they're asking what number you are on the docket. Uh, you know, finding your client may be an issue. We usually try to tell our clients to just wait outside until we've checked in and that we will text them because we know they have to leave their cell phones outside. Um, so we can meet them, you know, at the front door or the elevators and hopefully, you know, identify whether or not the other person is there because they're usually going to do that at the initial docket call. When you get there, you know, always tell your client it's a 9 a.m. docket call. They might have other stuff. Obviously, the criminal proceedings get higher priority because if everyone's right to a speedy trial, they're moving through their arraignment hearings for bail, but they will begin striking for default at 10, meaning if you're there um, with your client and that your client is the alleged victim and he or she is there waiting and nobody shows up, they could potentially adjudicate as early as 10 or dismiss as early as 10. So definitely don't miss 10 a.m. <laughs> if you're going to be late at all. Um, they like everybody, it's very hard for me, but they do like everybody to be seated, kind of how they used to do it at juvenile court, where you'd be seated with a microphone, and they want certain, you know, everybody takes a certain side just like you do in any court, but the petitioner sitting on the left side and the respondent sitting on the right side, and they actually, they set everything up. Um, like I said, COVID has changed things, and they're they're very conscientious about there being an incident, so they do kind of monitor and control how many people are in their period, but they'll usually always want your petitioners, your uh, victims sitting on the left side, and then responding parties, alleged aggressors are sitting on the right side, so it's kind of a natural progression when you move up to council table that that's the same side that you'll keep. And then, I of course, always set up council in the middle because that just makes sense that you're going to be on the, to me, the outside of either party who might feel like they need protection from the other one at that moment. But I don't know if that's a rule. I just always have put the witnesses or the petitioners on the outside. So 363601, in the E part where I'm talking about what is the correct court for filing, we obviously have uh, a special court here that is handling those but if you're in a county that has a lesser you know a smaller population than what we have they may be filing those differently and they may be going to their regular general sessions judge so if you file them out in Fayette if you've ever done that before defended one there you are going to be with Judge Peeler um, who wears multiple hats as the juvenile court slash general sessions judge, which is common in counties with a smaller population. So, you know, there, there's a whole thing about the reason, I just always say call the clerk, you know, figure out where, where we think it was filed and call and figure out, 
is the chancellor going to be hearing it? Do they have a special general seven session civil judge? What's going on? Where has it been filed? In what case has it been filed? You know, meaning has there also been a divorce action that we haven't been served with, but the sheriff got the request for this order of protection to us, you know, sooner? Um, and kind of breaking that down, meaning you might have had a private attorney, but they still might have taken the order of protection to be served by a sheriff uh, because your client did that piece of it first, then they contacted you. Now you're coming in, you're filing a divorce, and you have a private process server, but you aren't exactly sure where your order of protection is supposed to be heard, or can you just move it into the divorce action you just filed? Does that make sense? Okay. So then I just always tell everybody to call the clerk. I mean, there's there's a specific part of the statute that talks about if the county has this much population, how, how it gets done. But to me, it's always just easier to go to the horse's mouth. Um, you can amend the petition. That's what we talked about before. Not only can you, but yes, you should to make sure that you, especially if you're taking over something that was started by your client pro se, that everything that could possibly be in there has been in there and that you have made a prima facie case on the petition itself to have your petition sustained. Although there is liberal construction construed in favor of victims if they are pro se initially, my experience has been that once you take over, even if you took over yesterday, they no longer liberally construe in the hearing room. You might um, have some success in state court with that, but my experience has been that they are saying basically you're a private attorney and um, I hear you telling me that your, pri your client started pro se, but they're not here pro se, so that doesn't really explain why you haven't amended the petition. And so that's why I was stressing that before. They have to have at least five days notice prior to the hearing, a responding party prior to the hearing moving forward, they'd be entitled to request a continuance on that basis alone, that they hadn't been given enough notice prior to the hearing. Uh, there's, I've included TCA 22-215 and 2-216, but they really just talk specifically about giving notice to an out-of-state resident. That's important for us because we live in a tri-state area and your um, alleged aggressor might live in Mississippi or Arkansas and how do, you, how do you need to get notice to them? One thing I do want to bring up, it's not probably relevant as we sit here today, but I think it will be relevant and it could be relevant in years to come. The Violence Against Women Act is the piece of legislation which our order of protection laws um, arose out of and all of these forms started being created to try to get uniformity across states uh, as to these issues. And that's when we started moving away from this quasi thing that uh, attorneys had devised using traditional injunctive relief into the true order of protection causes of action and a that act was reauthorized a new version was passed and signed March 2022 and it does include on the back page I have that listed it, it has expanded the definition of abuse as to what we are traditionally used to seeing and one expansion of that definition is to include economic abuse, and I've listed the definition there. So I think that's just something to be aware of. Because even at this point, I think you could be making persuasive arguments uh, about this definition being adopted, even if they don't have any, you know, they're not precedential and not specifically adopted here. Well, I think the first thing is to recognize if you're dealing with the victim um, of any thing, lots of things are triggering for them that you might not realize. So I think one, th one thing is being extremely empathetic and acknowledging, I realize some of the things I'm gonna need to ask you about may be very personal, private, may, you know, be triggering for you, but here's what I need you to understand. Every detail of what occurred may have its own significant relevance. So you want to make sure that you're, you know, because here's the thing that I've seen, and I'm not even, you know, a victim's advocate, a detective, or somebody who deals with victims really, really regularly. 
people who have been the victim of something traumatic, whether it happened one time or a hundred times, get in the habit of big picturing it. Um, or they could get in the habit of, um, well, I won't get into that, but they could get in the habit of big picturing it. Like, here's what happened, and they don't give you all of the details. Um, and this is especially true if they've been the victim of any type of sexual violence. They um, gloss over some of that, and you have to, or I think you kind of have to do it like a soft, a very soft cross-examination where you kind of say, okay, and then what happened? And then what happened? To try to coax things that may be difficult for them to recount to another person. I think that would be the biggest part of the advice. And then every, what I try to do is every time they describe a single incident is follow up with if there's anything that, because sometimes they have documented things that they never move forward on. Sometimes they took pictures of their bruising and, and put it in their phone or kept it, uh, you know, asked their mom to keep some um, weird letter that the aggressor gave them or um, there might have actual been, you know, there might have been people that observed certain incidents. So that's the other thing I do and don't wait till the end is after they describe a single incident, I, I just kind of pause and ask them every single possible place I can get proof. Did you take any pictures? Did you have any recordings? Is anybody there when this happened? Could have anybody have overheard it? Meaning they might not have seen it, but they might have been in the home and heard what was happening. Um, did anybody see the bruises after the fact? You know, it could have been a coworker. It could have been somebody. They could have lied about where it came from, but somebody might have seen it and remembered it. So that would probably be the biggest advice I would give. And remembering to meet with them before any type of evidentiary hearing so that you can uh, go over that stuff again because the, the thing you'll see a lot of times with a DV, if you're representing a, an alleged victim, they will, if they make progress, they will get empowered. And that might make them seem less sympathetic, ultimately, um, at a hearing. And I, I hate saying that, but it's true. So you, you kind of <coughs> want to go over it because once they've been away from the aggressor, sometimes they might actually get indignant in their retelling of, of factual events and they sound a lot different than they did when you first interviewed them and you just have to help them realize I get that you're at this stage but this stage might not be ready be what the the trier of fact is ready to see from you so let's try to um, you know tone that down a little bit when we're presenting our proof that's a, that's another thing that I think I would tell people if you're representing victims because it can often be a long period of time before they actually tell that story in court and the um, they might not I mean to, to their credit they might not be the broken person you first started with and some of that might be to your credit too because you might have had other successes um, getting them temporary relief getting them some kind of exclusive use and possession while the order of protection is still pending and so that's that's something that you just have to make them aware of is is their perception and you know doing something like this i think is very helpful that's one of the reasons we set that up at our office so people can see their facial expressions and things when they are um, prepping for testimony because i think some of that they don't even realize they're different not in a bad way they're just they're not that crumbled person they used to be and they um and you know they kind of have a different affect than they had and so just kind of making them aware of that and getting them to a neutral place of presenting their proof I think that's probably a key thing